Hey everybody, welcome to the video. Let's go over the Superstart Batteries 400 at Kansas Speedway on Thursday night, July 23rd around 7 p.m. Eastern. But before we continue, as always, if you guys could just leave a like, and if you're new to the channel, you might as well hit that subscribe button because I'm going to be here all season long trying to help you guys become better NASCAR DFS players. And I cover other sports as well, and we are getting those sports back like today most of you are probably watching this on thursday we have baseball tonight so i'm super excited about that i'm sure you guys are as well so if you're going to keep coming back to the channel each and every single week or each and every single day you might as well hit that subscribe button and turn on the notification bell so you don't miss out whenever i post new content and if you want to follow me over on twitter i'm at chris 16 you can hit me up on ig at cpen16 and if you want to support my content over on patreon that's always much appreciated we have over 330 members now, which is absolutely awesome. I do appreciate each and every single one of you guys. So if you guys are interested in all my extra content, also for the other sports as well, hit the link in the description below. And if you're not, that's fine. Let's just get into the preview of this video. And as per usual, I forgot to mention when the live stream is going to be. Since the race is around 7, I'm thinking we could do the live stream at 5 p.m. Because I know a lot of you are probably at work in the middle of the day and you guys can't just hop on a live stream whenever. So I feel like 5 p.m. on Thursday or tomorrow or today, whenever you guys are watching this, would be a good time. If that is a good time, please let me know because I do want to do a live stream for this race because very quick turnaround from when we got in salaries out. And this is the first time I am looking at the entire slate from the price. I don't even remember all the guys' prices yet or the starting position. So we're going to go through this all together and I'll be more ready to go for the live stream. So uh, plan on 5 p.m. tomorrow. We could switch that to maybe before or something, but can't go later than 5 start time. But anyway, this is the Superstar Batteries 400. There's your outline of Kansas Speedway. It's a D-shaped oval, 1.5-mile track. Nothing special about it. 267 laps, which means we have 200.25 dominator points available, which means we're looking at typically two dominator builds. You Sometimes you can squeeze in three, but for the most part, around two dominator builds. Not as many laps as last week, but it's still 1.5-mile track. These tracks are not the most, don't produce the most exciting racing. So, and there's really nothing special about roster construction when it comes to the 1.5 mile tracks. Now the one cool thing about this race is it's going to be at nighttime, and you know everything's better at nighttime for the most part, especially for sports. So I am looking forward to it, but I think that's it for the preview. Let's get into the driver by driver breakdown. All right, so again, guys, my more polished thoughts are going to be on Patreon, obviously, but just my first thoughts on pricing. They priced the good guys up top, and then they I think they did a pretty good job with pricing. You know, they priced the best drivers at the top. You know, I mean, Eric Jones is on the 9K range, which is something we have not seen in quite a long time. I mean, he was stuck in that 7K range for a while, and then he rose up to the 8K range. Now he's up to 9K, which is honestly where he should have been all season long. I know he gets into trouble a lot, but he is a high upside kind of driver, and he does start further back in the pack. But for the most part, I think they did a pretty good job, so I think this is going to be a pretty good slate. So let's start up top. We have Kevin Harvick at 11,500, and he was the lucky draw of getting the pole this weekend, and that is bad news for the field because this could be an absolute Kevin Harvick clinic, if we're being honest. If we're already looking at the numbers at Kansas, Kevin Harvick is arguably the best driver here. He's averaging 70 DraftKings points per race the past six races, average finish of 7.7, .7, average running position of 6.6. .6. I mean, Kyle Busch, Martin Truex have all been great here, so is Chase Elliott and Denny Hamlin, but, I mean, Kevin Harvick, he's been leading the most laps the past six races, has the most fast laps, two top fives, has a win, has the best driver rating. Really, like always, you can never have anything bad to say about Kevin Harvick most weeks, and that holds true again. If we're looking at the 1.5-mile tracks the past 10 races, he's averaging the most DraftKings points per race, the most laps led, not the most fast laps, but he's still up there. I think he's in the top four with Ryan Blaney, uh, Truex, and Chase Elliott. And you got nine top tens, five top fives, two wins. And if we're looking at the 2020 statistics, obviously Kevin Harvick is going to check every single box this week, averaging nearly 60 DraftKings points per race. As a win, three top fives, six top tens, the most laps led. Kevin Harvick is an absolute animal, and now he's going to have clean air working his way. And the thing with Kevin Harvick is he's been drawing a pretty rough spot each time. He's never been on the front row yet since the random draw, and he's been, you know, from like fifth to twelfth it seems like. I know he started a third one race, but he's had to he's had to been able to move his way up, and for the most part he usually does. But now he's on the pole, and you know his he's got a good team on pit road. If they can keep him out front. I don't see how he's just going to get passed on a restart. So I think Kevin Harvick could lead a ton of laps at Kansas on Thursday night. 
Again, he has absolutely no PD upside, so he's going to have to absolutely lead laps in this race, but he's in the best position to do so, and he's had arguably the most dominant car this season. Now, he has not had the absolute best car at 1.5 mile tracks this year. That would be Mr. Ryan Blaney, and then technically Chase Elliott's been second fastest, but Kevin Harvick, he's been third, and He's been fastest since the restart. He's second in overall average green flag speed this season. He's actually inching right behind Chase Elliott. They're only a point, I think they're like a tenth off of each other now. So Kevin Harvick, he's an absolute animal. He's in the best position to lead laps. And even though there's going to be a competition caution, if he can just stay out front or hold, and even if he does lead the lead at some point, there's a good chance Kevin Harvick can regain that. I mean, the guy's just been so good this season. He's been arguably besides Ryan Blaney the safest guy you can or actually Ryan Blaney has had some incidents Kevin Harvick doesn't typically have incidents for the most part so he's really been the safest guy you've been able to roster this year and he's actually made eight optimal lineups which is second only behind Ryan Blaney and I mean there's just nothing you can really say against Kevin Harvick I, he's an excellent player he's in the pole should lead a lot of laps in this race Going down to Chase Elliott, he's 11th out. Oh, I should mention, I think Kevin Harvick is going to be one of the highest on drivers on the slate, even though he comes in with a very high price tag, because it's Kevin Harvick. Anyway, Chase Elliott, he's 11,000. He is he qualified 11th, and he seems to keep qualifying in the back here, so he's always been a good PD play with Dominator upside, and that's the same uh, once again at Kansas, and this has been a pretty solid track for him, averaging 53 DraftKings points per race, which is third best, only behind Kevin Harvick and Martin Truex, and right above Kyle Busch. And he has one win, four top fives, which is tied for the most with Truex, so he's been very solid here, averaging 15.5 laps led per race, which isn't a ton, but this season, that team's had a lot of speed, especially at the 1.5 mile tracks. He is second only behind Ryan Blaney and Green Flag Speed at the 1.5s this year. Now, if we're just going to look at his statistics at them, he's got a win, three top fives, the Second most laps led, tied with Martin Truex Jr. I'm, I apologize, fast laps, 27 laps led per race. And he's overall been fantastic. He has the second best average running position of 7.5, only behind Ryan Blaney. I mean, Ryan Blaney's numbers at 1.5 this season is absolute godlike, so no one's going to really come too close to him in that category. But Chase Elliott's been awesome. He's had a lot of speed this season. I know the results really haven't been there the past couple of races, but he's still an excellent option. And he's pretty safe, too, because he's going to give us a little bit of PD upside as well. Now, with the pricing being really solved this week, you're, it's going to be tough to play Elliott and Harvick together. I think he might be able to do that, but it might make more sense to pair him up with the guy in the 9K range. But, I'm again, I have not tried to build lineups yet, so I could be wrong. It might be decently easy to fit in a Harvick and Elliott or a Harvick and Truex, but I think Elliott's an excellent option, and if you want to get off some Harvick ownership, you could play him and hope he doesn't lead a ton of those race, which I think he probably will, but I still think Elliott's a pretty solid option, and he should be lower owned in tournaments, which, again, if you want to get different, you're going to have to pivot off some chalk, and I think Elliott's a really solid starting point for that. Then going down to Martin Truex Jr., he's 10,600. He is starting fifth, and it really sucked if you played Truex on Sunday last week because he had a really good car, and actually, early on in the race, he kind of screwed us because he ran out of gas. <laughs> I forget exactly where it was, but he ran out of gas, obviously dropped some spots, but then he regained that, and he was out front, let some laps, and then I believe he was in the top five, but there was like a little big one because Ryan Blaney checked up on the restart, caused everyone to stop, and then some. I think Eric Amarillo got into Kyle Busch, and then Kyle Busch, not purposely, but he just happened to turn Martin Truex, and Truex got absolutely... His car got shredded to pieces on that for the most part. They got him back out in the track, but man, that car looked awful. And it actually, it killed him in the average green flag speed department because at the 1.5 mile tracks this season, he did rank third. But his car was so slow after that wreck, he finished 30th in green flag speed at Kentucky. And, um, man, I'm sorry, at Texas. I was going to say Kentucky didn't sound right. At Texas. And... It dropped him all the way down to fifth now behind Joey Logano, Kevin Harvick, Chase Elliott, and Ryan Blaney. So if you remove that incident, he's still third in average green flag speed at the 1.5 mile track. So not worried about that. And he should have a ton of speed. And this has been a very, very good track for him. He has been pretty darn good at Kansas. So the past six races for him here, he's averaging nearly 70 DraftKings points per race. He has the best average finish of 5.7. He has two wins, which is the most of any driver the past six races. Four top fives, five top tens, averaging the second most lap slide at 40.2, only behind Kevin Harvick, and the third most fast laps at 25.8, only behind Kyle Busch and Kevin Harvick. Anytime we go to a 1.5 mile track, we should have interest in Martin Truex Jr. He is just way too good at these. Looking at the past 10 races at the 1.5s, he has four top fives, some of the most lap sled, some of the most fast laps, great numbers all around. If you're looking at his numbers this season, and I believe a seven race sample size, Averaging 50 DraftKings points per race, two top fives, 32.1 laps led per race. The guy has just been phenomenal. 
time per second and average fast laps per race. He brings a ton of speed at these 1.5 mile tracks. And the one thing about Truex is he's a very, very good night racer. It seems like every time there's a night race, you can expect Truex to have a pretty solid outing. I don't know what it is about that team at night, but when it when it's nighttime and the sun goes down, Truex seems to run very, very well. So that really gets my interest on Truex, and I think he's an excellent option. If we can play Truex and Harvard together in the same lineup, I would not be opposed to that because those I think there's a good chance two of those guys finish in the top three. I think top three, a good chance it could be Blaney, Truex, Kevin Harvick, maybe Chase Elliott, but... Definitely like Truex here, and he should be lower owned than Harvick. So if you want to pivot, I think Truex is another excellent option. Doesn't offer you as much PD upside as Hamlin or Chase Elliott, but I still think he's solid. So do like Truex. Going down to Denny Hamlin, he's 10,200. He's starting 10, so he's kind of like Chase Elliott where he's got a little bit of PD upside. And this has been a good track for him. He does have three top fives here. He led a ton of laps last year. I believe he led 150, 153 laps starting 23rd, and he did win the race. Absolutely phenomenal job by Denny Hamlin, and it looked like he was going to possibly win last week at Texas. Now, he kind of lucked out because Ryan Blaney took four tires instead of two, but it was going to be close because Denny Hamlin was really complaining about his car. He said he wasn't going to make it. He said Blaney's going to catch him. Who knows what could have happened, but the caution by Quinn Houff just didn't matter, so they finished outside the top five, I believe. I think Hamlin was... Did Hamlin finish in the top five? I'll have to check that. Oh, wait a second. No, he was the guy that, kept, yeah, Hamlin was the guy that kept breaking at the end and causing the cautions. I believe he finished around 20th place, so it wasn't a good finish for Hamlin, but he was running on the top for quite a while, and he actually had the lead for a little bit, but Ryan Blaney's car was just so, so good at Texas, and he overtook him very quick, but again, Denny Hamlin, he's a fine option. Now, at the 1.5 mile tracks this season, he is not that high in the average green flag speed ratings. And he's actually all the way down to 16th place in average green flag speed at the 1.5 mile tracks. So that is a little bit worrisome, but if we're looking at his track type 4 in the past 10 races of these tracks, I mean, he's got five top fives, which is tied for the most with Kevin Harvick and Chase Elliott. He's got two wins, although the driver rating is lower than the rest of this group, and the average running position is quite a bit lower than the rest of this group as well. But he's a guy that can lead laps. He's had one of the best cars all season long. Definitely a guy that can contend for a championship if we're looking at the 1.5 mile tracks this season. One win, three top fives, only an 85.9 driver rating, so it is a little bit concerning. He is averaging the least amount of DraftKings points per race between the big four here that we have of Hamlin, Truex, Chase Elliott, and Kevin Harvick. So while I'm not a big fan of Denny Hamlin in this race, I think he's an okay tournament option because he usually finds a way to get there at the end or get up front somehow. But I will say I much prefer Truex, Elliott, and Harvick. I think they have a much better chance of getting up front leading laps in this race. They've just shown more speed at these types of tracks this season, and... I don't know, I just feel a little bit better with them in my lineups, but I still think Hamlin's an okay tournament option. Now, going down to the 9K range, we have Ryan Blaney at 9,900 starting fourth, and you guys already know I'm a big Ryan Blaney fan, and I pretty much say it every week, but I'm going to say it again. I love Ryan Blaney this week. He's a good tournament option. Now, he is not as safe as he was last week. Last week, he was 8,900 starting second, and there was a good chance he was going to get a front at some point and lead a lot of laps, and he was just way, way too cheap. I think they did a really good job with this pricing. I still think he could be a 10K plus driver. I mean, he could take Hamlin's spot there in the 10,200 price tag, but 9,900 is a good price for Ryan Blaney. It makes it to where he's not just some free square, but you guys know Ryan Blaney has been absolutely amazing at the 1.5 mile tracks this season. I'll talk about his recent track history, but let's just look at his numbers this season at 1.5s. He's averaging nearly 70 DraftKings points per race, average finish of 5.4, which is the best, average running position of 5.8, which is the best, 116.1 drive rating, the best, no wins, but he's due for a win, and he really got screwed last week at Texas. He should have won that race. Four top fives, which is the most, six top tens, 37.3 uh, average laps left per race, 29.9 fast laps, which is the most. Ryan Blaney has been an absolute stud. He is first in average green flag speed by a mile at the 1.5s, especially at low tire wear 1.5s. So again, I think he's a really, really good option. Now, he's not just some cheap free square. You have, I mean, he kind of costs an arm and a leg here, so you can't just throw in Blaney with a guy like Truex and Harvick, I highly doubt you're going to be able to do that. So if you're playing Harvick, you could pair him with Ryan Blaney as your second dominator because he's really expensive, but there's a good chance Ryan Blaney is going to get a front lead laps in this race because I don't see why his speed would just diminish all of a sudden. And with no practice this year, I've kind of been using average green flag speed as like practice, I guess. And it's been working for Ryan Blaney. He was first in average green flag speed at Kentucky, Las Vegas, and Texas all... Uh, 
low tire wear 1.5 mile tracks and I just don't see why that speed's going to go away. I mean, they're using the same kind of tire combinations from Kentucky, Texas, and Las Vegas. I believe it's a mixture this week, but I mean, he was great at each track and I don't see why that speed's going to go anywhere. And if we're looking at the past 10 races at 1.5s, his, number check, his numbers check out. He's averaging the second most DraftKings points per race, five top fives, no wins, but he is really due for one. And the guy's just been absolutely incredible. He led over 150 laps last week, nearly 100 fast laps. And if we're looking at his numbers at Kansas, they're pretty good. Now, his average finish of 17.3 is a little bit skewed because if you look at his average running position, it's 7.4. And he actually had one of the best cars last race at Kansas. He was running near the front, but he just got into some incidents and gave him, I believe he finished outside the top 20, but average running position of 7.4, which I believe is second best or third best only behind Kyle Busch and Kevin Harvick. So I have a lot of confidence Ryan Blaney here. He has two top fives, three top tens, and he's just been on a whole other level this year. He is due for a win. So I like Ryan Blaney. He's a really solid tournament option. I'm not sure if we can call him a cash option this week just because he's nearly 10K and starting four, so there's not a lot of PD upside. But I really like him in tournaments, and I would not mind at all being overweight on Ryan Blaney, which I say pretty much every week, but it's been working out. He's made the most optimal laps this season at 9, right above Kevin Harvick, so ride the hot hand. I mean, we have no practice, so sometimes the best thing you can do is just ride the hot hand now with guys who have had fast cars at similar tracks, and Ryan Blaney checks all those boxes. So I do like Blaney. Kyle Busch, he's starting 8th. He's 9,700, and... As always, it's a good track for him. He's pretty much good at every single track. Five top tens, three top fives, second best driver rating, second best, or actually best average running position of 6.2. The numbers all check out for Kyle Busch. He's led laps here. The problem is we have no practice, and that's really hurt Kyle Busch. And we actually have no practice for the rest of the year. So I'm honestly concerned if Kyle Busch is even going to win a race this year, which would be crazy if he doesn't. But it wouldn't surprise me <laughs> because that team needs practice. And once again... He was looking solid at Texas, but whenever he got into the lead, that's when Jimmy Johnson got turned, and then he lost that lead pretty quick, which was I was very thankful for. I, I appreciate the sacrifice from Jimmy Johnson because I had like 1% Kyle Busch because I, I told you guys I was fading him, and I got real sweaty when Kyle Busch had that lead because his car was actually looking pretty solid, but fortunately for me, ended up not, not leading much laps at all. So, But once again, I just... It's hard to justify playing Kyle Busch. I think he's okay in tournaments. He did look strong last week uh, for a decent amount of the race. And the problem is he, he just has no speed at these 1.5 mile tracks this season. He actually ranks fifth overall this year in green flag speed. But if you look at the 1.5 specifically, he ranks 12th. And that's the that's really, really slow for a guy that's 9,700. Ryan Blaney's first. Keslowski's in the top five. Joey Logano's in the top five. Eric Jones is starting 21st. So I'm really not even concerned about him dominating getting up front. So Kyle Busch, he's a hard sell for me. I'd rather play Keslowski. I'd rather play, I don't know if I'd really rather play Joey Logano, but I mean, all these guys have had much more speed than Kyle Busch this season. So it's just hard to trust him. You can look his way in tournaments, but if you're looking at his numbers at 1.5s this year, it's pretty depressing. He's only averaging 32 DraftKings points per race, average running position of 11.9. He has three top fives, but no wins, four top tens, only 4.1 laps led per race. And that's something we expect out of Kyle Busch. We expect him to come out and lead laps, and that's just not something he's been able to really do this year at them. So Kyle Busch is a hard sell for me. I'm going to have some ownership in tournaments just because it's Kyle Busch, but he's not like a core play for me heading into the week. Almost at the weekend, Thursday night. All right, Brad Keselowski, he's 9,500. He is starting seventh, and he's a solid option. He's not someone I'm overly excited about playing, but he has won here recently. He's got an average finish of 9.2, two top fives. Not a big lap leader here, with only 9.7 laps led per race, but he's just one of those guys that usually finds a way to hang around long enough, or he gambles and he ends up up front at one point. That's just something Keselowski does, and I could see something similar happening again. He's a guy I'm not really going to be too excited playing up. Excited excited playing on Thursday, but 9,500, he's a decently easy fit in our lineups, and I do think Ryan Blaney could carry more ownership. I also think Kyle Busch could probably carry some more ownership as well, and Eric Jones should carry more ownership. So I think Joey Legato and Keselowski are going to go a little bit lower owned here, and I wouldn't hate taking some stabs at tournament. Not really sure if I want to go overweight on those guys, but I think match on the field at least might be a decent option because Keselowski's got a race-winning upside. He's top five in average game flag speed in any category, so... I don't mind Kess here if you're looking at his numbers at 1.5s this year, averaging 46 DraftKings points per race. Second best average finish of 7.4, has a win, only one top five, but he's finished in the top 10 each and every single time with seven. So he's been very, very consistent in that department. So Koslowski's fine. He's not like an overly excited play for me, but he can certainly be a candidate to get up front and lead laps. 
Now you have Joey Logano. He's 9,300. He's starting second. And I would have some interest in Logano, but the problem is he's starting right beside Kevin Harvick. And I have a hard time seeing Kevin Harvick not get the lead early on. And then after that, there's a good chance Logano could get shuffled back, depending on what happens on pit road for the competition caution. Depends who stays out, you know, whatever. So Logano is not someone I'm really interested in just because playing Logano and Kevin Harvick together. I know I said I liked Omerl and Blaney together last week, but they were also both in the 8K range. Now we're talking about a guy that's 11500 and a guy that is 9300 so there's a lot more salary there. And, you know, Kevin Harvick, I just can't see him giving up that lead at Joey Logano. So I'm going to sprinkle in Logano just in case Kevin Harvick gets a bad jump. You know, things can happen. Because if Logano comes out here and leaves a ton of the early portion of the race, I don't want to miss the boat. So I'll have a little bit of Logano, but not someone I'm really too interested in. Eric Jones, he's starting 21st. He's 9,000, and the problem with Jones is they priced him all the way up. But you're gonna, you guys are gonna hate me, but I do like Eric Jones. I like him and Ryan Blaney pretty much every single week, and thankfully it worked out last week. So it was a good day to be the leader of the Ryan Blaney and Eric Jones fan club on Sunday at Texas. This time I hope it is again because this has been a very good track for Eric Jones. He's got an average finish of 13th here, average running position of 11.5. Two top fives, finished third here recently. He has four top tens, not really expecting to lead laps, but Eric Jones shook attempt for a top 10 here. And it, starting 21st, that's not too bad. I think he's a safe bet for around 45 fantasy points, maybe upside of more, depending if he can maybe crack the top five, which he almost did last weekend. So I do like Jones. Now, the price tag might keep some people off him, but I do think he's a pretty solid option. Now, if you're looking at his numbers this season at the 1.5s, they've been pretty brutal. But for the most part, it's been due to him getting into incidents. He ran well at Homestead. He ran well at Atlanta. But again, he got into some trouble. He had a loose wheel. I believe it was at Homestead. And then at Atlanta, he was running well. But after a restart, Christopher Bell got into his tire and cut it. And then after that, he just really could not recover. So due to that, he's got an average finish of nearly 20th. Average running position of 15.5 is a little bit better. But for the most part, he's a top 10 contender every single race. It's just he's a big wild card because he can get into incidents, but the guy's got some major upside, so I do have interest in Eric Jones. And if we go down to the 8K range, we have Jimmy Johnson. He comes in at 8,900, and he's been getting really unlucky the past two races. At Kentucky, he was in the top three when Keselowski spun him near the end of the race, and then at Texas last weekend, he looked like he had one of the best cars in the field. I mean, he was flying, I believe. I believe he started 20th, and then after a few laps, he was inside the top 10, I believe, and then I believe he ended up getting a penalty, and then he drove his way back up, but then once Kyle Busch took that lead, that's when his car went right into the wall. Pretty much killed his day. I believe he was eight laps down at one point, moved up the field a little bit, but for the most part, it was kind of just a throwaway day for uh, Jimmy Johnson at Texas, but he's been pretty good at the 1.5s this year for the most part. So if we look at his numbers, at 1.5s in 2020. He's got an average finish of 21 point, or, I'm sorry, at 12.1. Before the race at Texas, he was actually inside the top 10. So he's had actually had a really solid car at the 1.5s. He has two top fives, three top 10s. Finished inside the top 26 out of the seven races here. He's picked up some fast laps. Jimmy Johnson's fine. I think a lot of people are going to go with Eric Jones and Jimmy Johnson as place differential guys if you're paying up a little bit, and I think that's a good way to go. I think Eric Jones will carry some more ownership than Jimmy Johnson. So if you want to pivot off of a high run play, you could look at Jimmy. I feel like they're going to be close in ownership, but I do think Eric Jones will get the slight nod there just because I feel like a lot of people like playing Eric Jones. I know I say to play Eric Jones pretty much every week, but he tends to be pretty high-owned most races, so I expect that to happen again with, uh, with uh, EJ there. I don't know why I called him. Just I don't know why I just called him EJ. I think I was thinking of JJ, but <laughs> anyway, Eric Jones, Jimmy Johnson, both find place differential plays in my opinion. Going down to Eric Amarola, he's 8,700, and he's one of the hottest drivers in the entire series now. His race at Texas was quite the roller coaster. And that was before even the race started. Like, I thought my day was just about to be done because Eric Amaral looked like he was going to be one of the worst plays on the slate because before the race even started, when they went, you know, did their caution laps and then they had to go down pit road to check their speeds, Amaral was reporting that he had no brakes. And then Bob Pockrass on Twitter tweeted out that Eric Amaral is going down pit road. And I was like, oh my gosh, we're all screwed because I had a lot of Eric Amaral. Apparently, Bob got that mixed up. He did not have to pit, and Eric Amarillo just dealed with it, but he had a fantastic car. Now, there was a couple of skewed stats on the green flag speed this week because some guys wrecked out, but if you 
take out the skewed stats, Eric Amarola had the second fastest car behind Ryan Blaney. He picked up over 40 fast laps. The guy actually passed Kevin Harvick on a green flag run for first place, which that doesn't usually happen. I mean, Eric Amarola has been absolutely amazing. He was running inside the top three. It looked like he was going to cycle to that, but then the caution came out, kind of screwed that up a little bit. But Eric Amarola has been on absolute fire, and they finally priced him up a little bit. He was in that 7K range, and then when he was on the pole, he was at 8,100. Now he's starting third, and he's 8,700. And i got to be honest, this might be the time to jump off the Amarola train. I'm not saying you fade him, because the guy's just been way too good. And there, there's a chance he could get the lead early from Harvick and Logano. It's a very slim chance, but I also thought that when uh, Kevin Harvick, Kyle Busch, and Joe Logano were in the uh, front four at K Kentucky, and Eric Amarola was the guy that got the lead. So you can't count him out. I would play a little bit of Amarola just in case, but... He's got a tough path here. We got some really good PD plays around him, like Eric Jones, Jimmy Johnson. Then below him, we have Tyler Reddick, Christopher Bell. So it's going to be a little tough sliding for Omarola at Kansas to make the optimal, but there's definitely paths to it. I mean, he has been so, so good for over a month now. So and like I said, with no practice, sometimes we just got to ride the hot hand. And Omarola definitely has one of the hottest hands in the entire series right now, him and Ryan Blaney. So you can look his way in tournaments. Definitely not a cash play this week, but... He's fine. He is fine. I mean, he actually has three top 10s here the past six races. Honestly, could have contended for another top 10 last year, but he got into an incident late in the race. I believe he had to serve a penalty, So, and he was running inside the top 10, top 10 contender for that race. So honestly, could have been four, but he should crack the top 10. But the problem is he's not where he's like at 7K now where we can afford him to lose some spots. Now he's at nearly 9K. So it's a tough spot for Omarola. He is strictly a GPP play only for me this weekend, even though he's just been running really, really well. Going down to Alex Bowman, he is starting 6, and this actually has been a pretty good track for him. In the past four races, he's got an average finish of 10th here. He has one top five, did finish second one year, has led some laps here, two top 10s. The problem with Bowman this year is he's got a good car for the most part, and he can run up front and lead laps, but the guy fades. He fades hard, or he gets into an incident and gets wrecked. I mean, he, the guy just has no good finishes at 1.5s this year. So if you're looking, he's been pretty good at the 1.5s. I said this last week, but he's got one of the biggest differences in average finish and average running position this year at them. He's got an average finish of 20.4, but you compare that to an average running position of 10th, which is actually one of the best. It's better than Keselowski. It's better than Kyle Busch. It's better than Denny Hamlin. He's been running really well at these types of tracks, but he just cannot get a good finish. He has zero wins, zero top fives, zero top tens, two top 15s and five top 20s, but he actually has 30.7 laps left per race, which is inside the top five. It's just the guy cannot get a good finish to save his life. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but the guy's just been getting unlucky. It could change. I think Bowman's a fine tournament play because he doesn't offer as much upside, or he offers us upside, but he doesn't offer as much PD upside starting six. But there's certainly a chance he can be a top five contender here. Might be able to get up front off some strategy, which that team's going to need to do something just to get up front. So Bowman's fine. He's a tournament option, but definitely not looking his way in cash games. Tyler Reddick, he's 8,300 starting 23rd, and... Look, I loved him at Texas last weekend, and it was looking really rough for a while because the guy started out really good. He was inside the top five, but then he faded hard. He actually got a lap down. Thankfully, he got that back, and then I think he took no tires. I remember he took, no, yeah, Austin Dillon took two tires. He took no tires, and he was first and second with Austin Dillon and ended up being one of the best plays in the entire slate. And for the most part, at 1.5s this season, Reddick's been great. If we just look at his numbers in 2020, Reddick's been arguably one of the better drivers at the 1.5s. He's got nearly 50 DraftKings points per race, average finish of 10.4, average running position of 13.1. He's got two top fives, four top tens. He's finished inside the top 20 each and every single time with seven top 20s. He's gotten fast laps. He's averaging 9.4 place differential spots per race at them. I think Tyler Reddick's an excellent play. I know they priced him up a little bit, but look, the guy's been so good at 1.5s and actually... He did run a race here before he was a full-time cup driver, and he finished inside the top 10. So Reddick, I think he's a really solid option once again. I know the price came up, but the guy's been fast this year, really good at the 1.5s, and I will continue to trust that. So I do like Tyler Reddick quite a bit. Christopher Bell, 8,100, starting 22nd. It's crazy not to see him in the 30s, but he actually made the jump in owner's points where he was inside the top 24. But still, he drew the back end of his starting range of 13th to 24, so the guy's just got terrible luck in the draw, but... This does make him a pretty decent option. I know it was not pretty for Christopher Bell last race at Texas, but he was running solid for the most part, but then he can really never overcome 
because he was a couple of laps down. Really couldn't overcome that. But he's got an average finish of 16.9 at these types of tracks this season. He's got three top 10s, four top 20s. I do think he's a pretty solid option. The price is very fair, 8100 It's not like we're paying 9 k or 11 k for him anymore. So I do think Christopher Bell's fine. I prefer Tyler Reddick, but Christopher Bell's a fine second for place differential in this price range as well. Kurt Busch, he's 8,000. He is starting ninth, and he's been one, actually one of the most consistent drivers in the series this season, and this has been a pretty good track for him. He's got an average finish inside the top 10. He's got two top fives, four top 10s, six top 20s. And with Kurt Busch, the thing is, he usually qualifies really high up, but he's actually on the back end of this 1 through 12 range, so I do think this makes him playable. I think he's going to be less owned than Chris Rebell and Tyler Reddick because he doesn't offer us as much PD upside. But I do think he has higher finishing position potential. I mean, he could crack the top five here. He's been very solid at the 1.5s this season. He's got an average finish of 10.6 at them. He's got five top 10s and seven chances, two top fives. And if we're looking at the past 10 races, he's got an average finish of 14 at these types of tracks, average running position of 12, three top fives, six top 10s. I think Kurt Busch is a pretty solid tournament option. I think there's better plays in cash like Reddick, but at 8,000 starting ninth, he could crack the top five here. So I don't mind Kurt Busch in tournaments. Now we're going down to the 7K range with William Byron at 7,800 starting 15th. And he's just another guy that can't really get good finishes. He has strong runs during the race, but they just don't really equate to much. And if you're looking at last week at Texas, he was running really well. I had a good amount of William Byron because I thought he'd be lower on than a couple of the place differential guys. So I went a little bit overweight on Byron. And then he finishes, I think, 37th because I believe Ty Dillon got into him, ended his day. I think it crushed his suspension or something, but... Yeah, it sucked. He's got an average finish of 20.7 at these types of tracks compared to a 15.6 average running position, only one top 10, no top fives, and three top 15s. But I still think he's fine. He's starting 15th. His ownership shouldn't be too high because he's kind of starting further up, but he's an okay option to me. He does have a top five finish at Kansas before. 7,800 is a fair price tag. He has shown a lot of speed at these types of tracks this season, so I do think he's a pretty interesting tournament option. Not super excited about Bayern. I do think there's better plays that are a little bit cheaper this week, but He's okay. MDB 7,700. He's starting 12th, and he once again gets a really bad starting spot in this uh, starting range of 1 through 12th, but makes him a decent uh, play for DFS, and his price is at 7,700, which I think is actually pretty fair, and I do have some interest in MDB here, especially in tournaments, because he was actually looking like he was going to have a strong finish at Texas, but the Quinn Howe thing kind of screwed his day up. But again, you can't look at his numbers because he's in a much different car now, much better equipment than the 21 car. So we're going to look past his Kansas numbers, and we're going to look at the t- current 2020 season 1.5-mile tracks, and he's been very solid. He has two top fives, average finish of 13.4, average running position of 13.2, really good drive rating of 86.3 in this price range, I should say. He's got four top 15s, six top 20s. I think he's a pretty solid play. He could contend for a top five, and he's done it multiple times this season. He's definitely a top 10 kind of guy, so MDB is a good play in tournaments for me. 7700 is a fair price tag. Price came down a little bit. I do like MDB. Clint Boyer, he's 7,500. He continues to be a little bit cheap here. Remember, he used to be in that 9K range. Now he's all the way down to the 7K range nowadays, which I guess kind of makes sense, but not really because he's a better driver than most of the 7K range. Like On most days, I would expect him to finish above Austin Dillon, Cole Custer, Stenhouse, MDB, Byron kind of. And I guess it kind of makes sense for the most part, actually. I just feel like he should be a more expensive driver than 7,500, though. So he does strike me as a value. But Kansas has been a very, very good track for Clint Boyer. He's got an average finish of 11.5 here. Average DraftKings points for race of 41.2. One top five, three top tens, five top 15s. He's finished inside the top 20 each and every single time the past six races here. He's actually looking like a pretty solid play. And don't forget, if you guys like some narratives, Clint Boyer is from the Kansas area. So this is technically his home track. And he has ran pretty well here, so... I think he is a pretty solid option. I really like the price tag. There's definitely PD upside here for looking at his numbers at the 1.5 mile tracks this season. It's not great, but he does have four top 15s, average running position of 16.4, average finish of 17.7. Good chance he moves up in this race. Is he going to contend for a top 10? Potentially. I think more so top 15, but he should finish anywhere from the 10th to 15th range. And if he's running really well, he might be able to crack the top 10. So I do like Clint Boyer. I like the price tag. I do think he's a pretty solid option. Cole Custer, he's 7,300. He's starting 24th, and I think he's okay. He did get that win at Kentucky, but he's an okay option. I mean, I don't love it, but he is starting 24th, so there's definitely some PD upside here. For looking at his numbers at the 1.5-mile tracks this season, he's got an average finish of 18.7, 
Again, that would be skewed a little bit because because he, he won, and we can't really expect Cole Custer to just rack up wins. So his average running position, I think, paints a better picture of 21.4. Drive rating of 65.2, which is also a little bit poor here, but he has finished inside the top 25 out of the seven races at 1.5s this season. He's got two top 15s. I think he finishes anywhere from 15th to 20th for the most part, which is not great. I do prefer Clint Boyer. I think he's got higher upside there. But Cole Custer's fine. I don't think he's going to kill you starting 24th. And he definitely has been running well for the most part recently. I know last week wasn't great for him because he got into an incident. But Custer's a fine option starting 24th. Uh, Austin Dillon, he's starting 16th. He won last week at Texas, which was absolutely awesome because I had a ton of Austin Dillon. I said he was one of my favorite plays in that six, actually my favorite play in that 6K range. And my favorite cheap op, cheap option. Yeah, I know he was 6,900, but yeah, that was awesome for Austin Dillon. I mean, he lucked out a little bit on the cautions, but to be able to hold that lead off from Joey Logano was pretty impressive. So I'll give Austin Dillon a hand there. And at the 1.5 mile tracks this season, he has been fantastic. If you're looking at his numbers just strictly at Kansas, he's finished inside the top 20 the past six races here. So he's it's 100% success right now. If we're looking at the 1.5s and 2020, Austin Dillon's got an average finish of 8.4, which is inside the top five for you know, the drivers. I believe he's actually a third best right behind Ryan Blaney and Brad Keselowski. So yeah, that's actually pretty amazing for Austin Dillon. Average running position of 12.7. He has a win. Again, a little fluky, but still, he's been running really well with these types of tracks he's got two top fives four top tens he's finished inside the top 15 each and every single time with seven top 15s and obviously seven top 20s the only downside with dylan this week is that he's starting 16 so there's not much pd upside but i do think this this lowers his ownership because if he was starting in the 20s at 7200 i think he'd be pretty darn chalky especially coming off a win from last week but starting 16th this makes him more of a tournament play, but I do not mind Austin Dillon because he's just been running so well at the 1.5s this year, and I don't see why that would just go away all of a sudden. So I do think he's a fine tournament option. Could you get could you get away with it in cash games? You could, but there are some better PD options than Austin Dillon. So I like him in tournaments. Cash are pushing it, but he shouldn't have it. He should contend for a top 15 here. Now Ricky Stenhouse Jr. He is starting 25th. He is 7,000. He got knocked down in owners points, so he's now in that 25th and back range. But I do think he's a pretty interesting play here. He does have an average finish of 16.3, average running position of 17.5, three top 15s and five top 20s the past six races here. So I think there's plenty of PD upside here. If you're looking at his numbers at 1.5 mile tracks this season, he has two top fives, four top 20s, three top 15s, average finish of inside the, inside the top 20. He's not a guy I really expect to contend for top 15s most races, but Stenhouse so starting 25th, I think he's a pretty safe option. He shouldn't kill you, which I know saying Ricky Stenhouse Jr. shouldn't kill you might be kind of bold because the guy definitely can kill you a lot, but I think he's okay. I do think he's a pretty solid option starting 25th at 7K. Going down to the 6K range, we have Matt Kenseth, 6,900 starting 14th. I really have no interest in Kenseth here. If you're looking at his numbers this season at 1.5 mile tracks, average finish of 22.2, average running position of 23. One top 15, two top 20s. The numbers are pretty ugly for Matt Kenseth. Only a drive rating of 61.8. I mean, you could look at his previous numbers here, but you really can't because, again, he retired, different car, and even then the numbers really aren't that great anyway. So Matt Kenseth is not really an option for me this weekend, even though he's cheap, but I just have a hard time seeing Kenseth crack a top 10 here. Now, John Hunter Nemechek, 6,800. He's starting 30th, and he got a pretty big price bump from last weekend. Which doesn't make the most sense to me because he started 28th last week and he didn't do that great. He got inside the top 25, but he was starting 28th. Now he's starting two spots higher up and they gave him a nearly 1,000 price bump. Seems a little odd to me. He's an okay option, but there's just better, cheaper options in my opinion. You got McDowell all the way at 6,200. You got Ty Dillon starting 36th at 6,500. And you got Priest at 5,800. So I don't like the price on John Nemechek. The guy can't contend for a top 20. If you're looking at his numbers this season at 1.5 mile tracks, he's actually gotten a couple. He has three top 20s and one top 15. Average finish of 22. Average running position of 22.1. He's probably going to be in that 20th to 25th range, which is okay. But it's nearly he's nearly 7K, and I think Stenhouse offers us more upside. So I just don't like the price on Nemechek. Paying 7K for him just seems a little bit too much. Ryan Newman, he's 6600. He is starting 18th, and it's probably right around where he's going to finish. If you're looking at his numbers at the 1.5 mile tracks this season, average finish just inside the top 20 at 19.8, running position of 20.2. He has four top 20s and two top 15s, but 
there's just other guys that are much safer, like Ty Dillon's 100 less than him, and he's starting 36, which is just double 18. So I think Ty Dillon's a much safer option. Does Ryan Newman have higher finishing position upside than Ty Dillon? Yes, but I don't think that really outweighs him starting 18 spots higher up than Ty Dillon. So Newman's a tough play for me. But Ty Dillon starting 36, I expect him to be pretty popular on this slate because it's not like Ty Dillon's been great at the 1.5s this season. Average finish at 24.4, which is pretty much the same as his average running position. But the guy can't contend for top 20s. He's got two of them so far this season. He actually has a top 10 and one top 15. And if you're looking at his numbers at Kansas, they're pretty much similar. Average finish of 23.8, average running position at 25. But we're realistically looking at like 10 to 15 spots gained here at 6,500. We'll take it. He does have a couple of top 20s at Kansas, so I do think Ty Dillon's a pretty solid, safe option, and he should carry a decent amount of ownership starting at 36th. Bubba Wallace, he's starting 17th. Again, another guy I really just don't have much interest in. They finally dropped his price. I mean, he was in that 7K range, which made absolutely no sense to me. So 6,300 makes it a little bit better, but it's just a tough sell for Bubba Wallace. I mean, he's got an average finish of 28th here. This season at these types of tracks, he's got an average finish of 22.4, 22.8 running position. Does have three top 15s and one top 10, but there's just much better plays that are starting further back around this price range. So Bubba Wallace is pretty much a fade for me. Maybe you could sprinkle him in a few lineups if you're building 150, but outside of that, I don't see how Bubba Wallace makes the optimal lineup here. But Michael McDowell, another guy who's just going to be chalk once again. I mean, every single week, Michael McDowell, chalk or value chalk, whatever you want to call it pretty much works out. The guy's been running really well this season, and this has been a decent track for him compared to what Michael McDowell usually puts up. He's got three top 20s here the past six races, averaging nearly 30 DraftKings points per race, average finish with 21.3. They're not like great numbers, but for him, they're pretty good, especially a guy that's 6,200 starting 27th. If you're looking at his numbers this season at them, he's got three top 20s, two top 15s, Average finish of 22.6. The guy's probably going to finish around 20th place, but he has shown upside for more. I mean, we've seen him in that 15th to 20th place range. We've even seen him crack a couple of top 10 so far this season. So McDowell, once again, he's the guy that everyone's going to flock to, and he does make sense. So I do like Michael McDowell. Daniel Suarez, he's starting 37th. He's 6,100. You know what you're going to get with Suarez at this point. You're getting pretty much a 25th to 30th place car. There's just not a lot of upside. But at 6,100, I do think he's viable, as gross as that sounds. I mean, he's got an average finish this season of 28.3, average running position of 29.5. He could potentially gain about 10 spots here. Is he going to contend for a top 20? Absolutely not. His car sucks. It's an absolute lawnmower. Average drive rating of 42, but as long as he stays alive, you know, doesn't get into any incidents, we're looking at roughly about 10 spots gain, which is not too bad at 6,100. When he was in that mid-7K price range, that's just laughable, but at 6,100, it is playable. Now, if you're looking at his stats at Kansas, you really can't because it's a much different car now. He's in the 96 now, not in the 41, which Cole Custer's in now. But even then, his numbers at Kansas weren't that pretty. Average finish at 23.5, but again, he's like a 25th to 30th place car for the most part. Going down to the 5K range, we have Chris Buescher, 5,900, starting 13th. He is starting really, really high, but Kansas has been a Decently solid track for him, and he was running really well at Texas last weekend, but did he, get, he got a penalty of some sort. Screwed his day, but he was running really well. I believe he was inside the top 12 at one point, for the most part, the top 15. And like I said, Kansas has been not too bad for Chris Busher. Average finish of 16.2 here, two top 10s, five top 20s, three top 15s. He's starting 13th, so you pretty much have to expect he's going to lose some spots. But that's not really going to hurt us at 5,900. If he scores, or if he finishes around 15th place, we're still looking at close to 30 points, which at 5,900 is not too bad. He's a very risky play, but he's a pivot off of Ryan Priest chalk or Michael McDowell chalk. And speaking of Ryan Priest, he's starting 35th. He's 5,800. I think he's going to be very high owned on the slate. Now, the past three races, he has not finished. He's finished pretty much dead last. So it's been really rough if you've been playing Ryan Priest. But at 5,800, starting 35th, it's kind of like we're at Indy. He was starting 36th, I believe, and he was in the 5K range. You just had to play him. I know it didn't work out where you wrecked, but you just can't really project wrecks unless we're like at Talladega or Daytona. So Ryan Priest, as long as he finishes the race, which I know is not something he's been able to do recently, but <laughs> he should be a very safe, solid option at 5,800. He's probably going to grade out as pretty much everyone's best value play. Maybe Michael McDowell does, but Ryan Priest, I mean, 5,800, starting this far back in the field, 
he makes he definitely makes some sense. If you're looking at his numbers at 1.5s this season, he's got an average finish of 30.3. Again, the guy just hasn't been able to finish a race recently, but he's got an average running position of 24.3, which is over 10 spots gained. So I think Priest is a pretty solid option here. I know it's been pretty ugly for him, but he should be fine. Corey LaJoy, 5,700. He's starting 35th, 35th, 31st. He's a decent pivot off of Ryan Priest. I don't think he's going to finish above Priest, but LaJoy's okay. He can, t- he can contend for a top 25. This season at the 1.5, he's got an average finish inside the top 25 at 22.7. Average running position of 26.1. He actually has three top 20s as well, which is something Ryan Priest cannot say. So LaJoy's a fine option to pivot off of Priest. But after the joy, I have no interest at all in any of these guys. I'm not going to play Yaley, Sorensen, Poole, McLeod, Hill, Gase, Blicky, Smithley, Half. Not going to be in my lineup. So that's going to be pretty much it for the video, guys. I would not go below Corey LaJoy, preferably Priest, but LaJoy is a fine pivot. But if you guys made it through the entire video, please let me know. I always love seeing who all made it to the end. I really do appreciate you guys watching. Remember, we're going to be going live probably around 5 p.m. tomorrow, so... Be on the lookout for that. If you haven't watched my baseball video, you can check that out as well. I posted that yesterday. But yeah, that's pretty much going to be it for the video, guys. Appreciate you guys watching. Leave a like if you haven't already. Subscribe to the channel. Check me out on Patreon. Follow the socials, all that good stuff. And I'll see you in the next video.